Convocation is now in session. Today, it is my pleasure to preside over this very special presentation and ceremony in honor of Dane Jane Goodall. As acting chancellor, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to our 311th Convocation. Before we proceed, I'd like to call upon Dr. Angie Mandic to present Western University's land acknowledgement. of the Anishabi, Haudenosaunee, Lenape, and Attawandran peoples, all of whom have had long-standing relationships to the land of southwestern Ontario and the City of London. The First Nation communities in our local area include Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. And in our region, there are 11 First Nation communities, as well as a growing Indigenous urban population. Western values the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations and of all the original people of Turtle Island, also known as North America. Megwetch, thank you. It is my distinct honor to preside over today's special event. And indeed, this is a special convocation at our university. Dame Jane Goodall, a champion of animal rights and an inspiration to all of us at Western, including our students, faculty, staff, and alumni, is here to speak to us about her wonderful experiences. Our community is very fortunate when someone so well known around the world and internationally renowned for a significant body of research joins us on campus. In honor of her visit, we are gathering for a special presentation and to also confer an honorary degree upon Dame Jane Goodall in acknowledgement of her outstanding career as an internationally recognized primatologist and ethologist and in recognition of the excellence that she exemplifies as a leading advocate for conservation, animal welfare, and environmental sustainability. As a role model for women, especially in the sciences, she has broken many barriers in pursuit of her passion for field-based animal research. To present our distinguished candidate, I now call upon Professor Amarita Rebecca Coulter, Faculty of Education. Dr. Jane Goodall. Dr. Jane Goodall has been called a naturalist, an ethologist, a primatologist, and an anthropologist. She is described as an advocate for chimpanzees, an environmental activist, a conservationist, a mentor, a teacher, and an ambassador for peace. And the truth is that this amazing woman is all those things, and what's more, She'll show you how to pant hoot like a chimpanzee. In 1960, Jane Goodall began her field study of chimpanzees in Tanzania and very quickly established herself as the leading scientific authority on our nearest relatives. This was a remarkable achievement for a young woman who had not yet attended university although it did mean that she came to research with an open mind, unencumbered by any narrow disciplinary assumptions about how field work ought to be conducted. The success of her approach to research revolutionized the methods used to study animals in the wild, especially monkeys and apes. By building relationships with the chimpanzees, and through patient, careful observations conducted over decades, Dr. Goodall established that chimpanzees have complex social systems, utilize a rudimentary language system, and make and use tools. She documented the mothering skills of female chimpanzees and the formation of long-lasting close bonds in family groups. She also confirmed that chimpanzees have rich emotional lives and, like humans, can act with murderous intent or with care and compassion. 
In addition to her ongoing work at the Gombe Stream Research Center, Dr. Goodall has established an international research program, Chimpanzoo, to study captive chimpanzees in zoos and improve their lives. She also founded the Chimponga Chimpanzee Rehabilitation Center, the world's largest chimpanzee sanctuary in the Republic of Congo, where orphaned babies rescued from the black market receive care. When it became clear that chimpanzees and many other animals were facing extinction because of human predation in the form of deforestation, resource extraction, the bushmeat trade, and trophy hunting, Dr. Goodall made the decision to shift the emphasis of her work to conservation and environmental sustainability. She adopted a community conservation approach to support the livelihoods, health, and well-being of human and non-human animals. By focusing on sustainable agriculture, reforestation, micro-business development, ecotourism, the construction of schools and clinics, access to family planning, and the reduction of infant and mother mortality rates, human lives were improved and chimpanzees were protected. Dr. Goodall uses many strategies to promote environmental sustainability. She educates and activates using popular education strategies and multimodal approaches, including YouTube, websites, social media, documentary films, and participation in television interviews. I might add, just as an aside, also participating in convocations. <laughs> Through a worldwide system of children's groups called Roots and Shoots, 600 of which operate in Canada, she encourages the next generation of environmental and conservation activists to act locally. And did you know you can enroll in a MOOC called Cultivating Compassionate Leaders, which Dr. Jane instructs. She leaves no medium unused given the urgency of her message. But she also offers these words of hope. There is still a window of time. Nature can win if we give her a chance. Mr. Chancellor, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor and in the name of the Senate, I ask you to confer the degree of Doctor of Science, Honoris Causa, upon Dr. Jane Goodall. By virtue of the authority vested in me as Acting Chancellor, I admit you to the degree of Doctor of Science, Honoris Causa. Congratulations, Dr. Goodall. On behalf of all assembled here today, it is a pleasure and honor to invite our newest alumna, Dr. Jane Goodall, to address convocation. Well, thank you very much for this great honor. And I'm very proud to be standing here 
but apparently I am to give you a greeting that you would hear if you came with me to Gombe National Park in Tanzania. <laughs> and and that simply means this is me, this is Jane. <laughs> so I have had a rather strange career and a slightly unusual one. And I want to start off by congratulating my amazing mother who supported my love of animals when I was just a very small little girl taking earthworms to bed. And instead of being mad at me, she said they'd die if I left them there. She didn't even get angry after calling the police when I'd been lost for four hours because I was waiting in a hen house, wondering where on earth was the hole big enough for an egg to come out. <laughs> so when I was 10, I found a little book. We had very little money. World War II was raging. And I just had saved up enough money to buy it in a second-hand bookshop. And it was called Tarzan of the Apes. I took it home. I fell madly in love with this glorious lord of the jungle. And what did Tarzan do? He married the wrong Jane. <laughs> it was at that time that I had a dream of growing up, going to Africa, living with wild animals and writing books about them. Jane, how will you do that? You don't have any money, Africa's far away, and you're just a mere girl. Dream about something you can achieve, but not my mother. She said, if you really want something, you'll have to work really hard, take advantage of opportunity, and never give up. And so I accredit her with a great deal of what I've been able to achieve because of that support for this childhood vision of mine. Anyway, to cut the story short, I couldn't afford university. I did well at school, but we didn't have enough money. We had just enough money for secretarial, boring a job in London, letter from a school friend inviting me to Kenya for a holiday, worked as a waitress in order to save up the money for the for the return fare by boat in those days. That's how long ago planes weren't going back and forth back then in 1957. And having stayed with my friend for a bit, I heard about someone called Dr. Lewis Leakey, paleontologist, spent his life searching for the fossils of Stone Age humans. So somebody said, Jane, if you're interested in animals, you should meet Lewis because he was interested not only in the bones of the fossil animals he found uh, and the fossil humans, but also in modern descendants of those creatures. And I went to see him. He gave me a job. Secretarial training, boring, but he just lost his secretary and needed a secretary. Yes, so there I was. <laughs> and you never know in life when something is going to matter a lot. So he gave me a job. He was impressed by how much I knew about African animals because I'd spent all my time reading every book that existed. And so eventually he offered me this amazing opportunity to go and live with and learn from not any animal but the one closest to us. Why did Lewis Leakey want to send me out to try and learn about chimpanzees? Because he believed rather ahead of his time that about six million years ago, there was a common ancestor, ape-like, human-like. And from the bones of early humans that Leakey dug up, you can tell a lot um, from, from the bones about whether the creature's upright or not, from the wear on the teeth, what they're eating, the size of the brain, and so forth. But behavior doesn't fossilize. And he was always fascinated in wondering how Stone Age men and women might have behaved. And so he reasoned that if Jane will find behaviors perhaps similar in these chimpanzees to ourselves, then perhaps those behaviors originated six million years ago in the common ancestor, and that we brought them with us in our separate evolutionary pathways. And that, he reckoned, would help him better imagine the life of these early humans. That's why he sent me. And of course, the first first problem was getting money. I hadn't been to college, but it was a wealthy American businessman 
Second problem, the authorities in what was then Tanganyika, the remnants of the crumbling British Empire, refused to take responsibility for a young girl on her own out in the forest. What a ridiculous idea. But eventually they said, oh, well, if she brings someone with her. And so the volunteer was that same remarkable mother. And she came for four months. We had money for six. And she really boosted my morale because at first the chimpanzees ran away as soon as they saw this peculiar white ape because we are the fifth great ape. But she would say, Jane, you found that peak and you're learning more than you think. You're learning about the calls they make, how they bend over branches in the trees to make sleeping nests, how they move around sometimes alone, sometimes just a group of males hanging out, sometimes a mother and her young, sometimes a couple of families. And sometimes when a nice new fruit comes ripe, many of these smaller groups will join up. They form actually a community, all members of which know each other. And it's about 50 at Gombe in a community. And then there's a lot of excitement and shouting and yelling and the chimpanzees feed together. So she said, you're learning more than you think. It was sad that she left just before the breakthrough observation when I saw the first chimp who began to lose his fear of me, whom I named David Greybeard because of his beautiful white beard, uh, breaking off grass stems and using them to fish termites from their underground nest. And then breaking off leafy twigs and to use them as tools, he actually had to modify them by removing the leaves and the side branches, which is the beginning of tool making. If you saw that today, it wouldn't be exciting, but back then, this is now 1960, back then it was thought that humans and only humans used and made tools. In fact, Professor Osman Hill, very famous as a paleontologist, defined us as man of the toolmaker. And so Leakey, because of that observation, was able to get money from National Geographic Society to enable me to continue the research and they sent a photographer and filmmaker, Hugo van Lauwig, to record what I was gradually learning more and more as the chimpanzees lost their fear, until it was almost as though they ignored me when I was around. And I began to know them as individuals, and I began to learn something about their behavior. Louis Leakey was really excited when I talked about chimpanzees kissing, embracing, holding hands, patting one another on the back, swaggering, uh, competing for dominance among the males. In fact, some of the swaggering <coughs> males remind me of some human politicians. Uh, <laughs> I shall name no names. And so he, he was really, of course, fascinated by the tool using about nine different tools used at Gombe. I think it was, it's very significant that chimpanzees like us have a long childhood. So the child is traveling with the mother till about eight, sometime after the next child is born. There's only one baby every five years. And I think this long childhood is useful for them because like us, the child has a lot to learn. And they learn by watching, by imitation <coughs> and practice. And that is one definition of human culture. So we know today that right across Africa, wherever chimps have been studied, they show different cultural behaviors. Yes, they have a dark side. They're capable of something like a primitive war. But as you heard, they also have a loving, compassionate side. And they're capable of true altruism. So it became clearer and clearer. There's no sharp line dividing us from the rest of the animal kingdom. Yet when I got to Cambridge University in 1962, because Lewis Leakey said I had to get a degree, that he wouldn't always be around to get money for me, and there was no time to mess about with a BA, he said, I've got you a place in Cambridge University to get a PhD in ethology. I didn't even know what ethology meant. <laughs> but I was very nervous when I got there. And imagine how I felt when many of the professors told me that I'd done my study completely wrong, that I shouldn't have named the chimpanzees, they should have had numbers, that I shouldn't talk about them having personality 
or minds capable of problem solving, and certainly not emotions. I was guilty of the most terrible anthropomorphism. But fortunately, I'd had this wonderful teacher when I was a child who taught me that however erudite these professors were, in this one respect, they were wrong. And that teacher was my dog, Rusty. <laughs> So whether you share your life with a dog, a cat, a horse, a cow, a pig, a bird, I don't care what it is, you know that that's not true. And yet I was taught back then that the difference between us and other animals was one of kind. Now we know, partly thanks to the chimpanzees, we've made a breakthrough in scientific thinking. And we know now that we are truly part of the animal kingdom. And there are now students studying not just in monkeys and apes, but in many other kinds of animals, including birds and octopus and even insects. They're studying personality differences. They're studying emotions in some of those animals anyway. And in all those that I've mentioned, they're studying intelligence. We're learning more and more all the time about how arrogant we've been. And we learn new respect for these other creatures. I think one of the reasons that the chimpanzees were so helpful in breaking down this, this uh, antiquated thinking was that we, we have learned how like us biologically the chimpanzees are. So that in the composition of DNA, we and chimpanzees and bonobos, we differ by only just over 1%. And there are striking similarities in the immune system, in the composition of blood and the anatomy of the brain. And so, as I say, we recognize today that we are part of the animal kingdom. How tragic that we are so fast destroying this planet. I talked about the similarities between us and chimpanzees. What's the main difference? Of course, there are many, but to me, it's the explosive development of the intellect. And yes, chimpanzees and other animals are way more intelligent than we used to think, but for heaven's sake, we've designed a rocket that went up to Mars, and a little robot crawled out and was taking photographs for years. And we've seen those photographs. Mars doesn't look very hospitable for us to go and colonize. We've got one planet, planet Earth. How is it that the most intellectual being that's ever walked this planet is destroying it. And I don't need to enumerate the ways in which we're destroying planet Earth because you all know. It seems to me there's been some kind of divide between this clever, clever brain and the human heart, love and compassion. And we're making decisions with no thought of future generations. The, it was Chief Seattle who said, we haven't inherited this planet from our parents. We borrowed it from our children. We've been stealing their future, and we're still stealing it today. And I truly believe that only when head and heart work in harmony can we attain our true human potential. But yes, I will end by saying I do believe there's a window of, of hope for us, but only if each and every one of us does our part. And it's so important to remember because people say to me, but Jane, I know we're harming the planet, but what can I do? I feel useless, I feel helpless. And so people sink into apathy and do nothing. And it's so important to remember that each and every one of us makes some kind of difference each and every day. The consequences of the small choices we make, what do we eat, what do we buy, what do we wear? Where did it come from? Is it cheap because of child slave labor? Did it involve horrific animal cruelty, like the intensive farms? Did it harm the environment, like so many of the products we buy do? And if we start making ethical choices, then indeed we shall move towards a better world. But unless we involve the younger generations, all these efforts will be in vain, whether it's studying animals, whether it's working to improve the lives of local people to create partners. It's all of no use if we don't help the young people to be better stewards than we've been. And that's why I began this Roots and Shoots program, began in Tanzania in 1991, and it began with 12 high school students. 
It's now in 100 countries. We have young people of all ages, preschool, very strong in university, and I'll be very sad if there isn't a very strong Roots and Shoots group here soon. And we've also got all the people who've been through the program. Today, it's about 150,000 active groups in 100 countries, all understanding that each and every day, each one of them makes a difference. And that applies to us too. So thank you very much. Dr. Jane, thank you very much for that inspiring call to action. <clears throat> now, one of the things about a special convocation is that we can do some special things. And so uh, Dr. Jane is, um, going to, is prepared to take some questions. So uh, I've just been handed some questions uh, for just a few minutes. I need to take care of time as well as you took care of time. So I'll just, uh, I'll just start. We may only get through a couple, but um, are you game? Okay, so I guess you need, to, you need the other microphone, so. I can't promise to answer them all, but I can try. <laughs> well, this is interesting, because you're, you, so you started in the 1940s and you talked about the 1960s, so this question is, you have accomplished so much in your life. What would you like to do next? <laughs> well, do you know what I'd really like to do next? I'd like to discover what happens when we die because there's either nothing or there's something. And if there's something, then that will be such an exciting thing to discover. Did, and do you, you think get, you when can you give messages 80, back? What? <laughs> <laughs> so we'd all know? <laughs> yeah, but you know, when you get to be 84, you start thinking about those things. Yes. And so many people have said, I never looked at it like that. Now I don't mind thinking about dying. Okay, this is maybe a more controversial one. Um, a little bit. So the question is, what is your opinion on zoos? Are they powerful educational tools or are they cruel? It, it depends very much on the zoo and the kind of animal in the zoo. I think there are some animals like elephants, whales, dolphins, um, and a few more that should never be in zoos unless they're real huge sanctuaries. But I think what, you know, the the good zoo today, they've learned a lot since I, when I began, all zoos were terrible. They were just little bleak, bare prisons and terrible for me to go and see chimpanzees in that situation. Even worse in the medical research labs where of course they were experimented on because they're so like us. But now zoos have begun to understand that animals need enriched lives, that it's very boring if they have nothing to do, which is why I started this chimpanzee program. And also, we have to think of the life of animals in the wild. So often, it sounds idyllic, living in wild and free. But if I think of the chimpanzees in so much of their range, they live in fear. There's the sound of the chainsaws coming closer. There are wire snares that they get, that they get their hands or feet caught in. They are being, mothers are being shot to export babies still to Asia as pets or for entertainment. And so, you know, a really good zoo. I know so many people who said to me, well, it was in a zoo I looked into an animal's eyes and I realized I was looking into the eyes of a thinking, feeling being. And many people who've gone on to study wild animals started off in zoos. And also the, the best zoos are raising a lot of money for conservation and sending people out to help conserve wildlife. So close the bad zoos never put some animals in a zoo, but they're not all bad. Great, well thank you for that. Um, so, let's see. So we have one from one of our, some, from someone in the audience who's only 12. And she asks, when you were just starting out, did negative comments make you want to stop or keep going? Did whose comments? Negative comments. Did negative, negative comments. comments make you want to stop, 
doing what you were doing or keep going? Of course not. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> That's good advice, of course not. <laughs> My mother taught me, if you meet somebody who disagrees with you, number one, listen to them, because maybe they've got some points you never thought of. But if you still believe that you're right or righter than they are, then you must have the courage of your conviction. That's, uh, for those of us who have been at universities with supervisors, to think of a young woman going to Cambridge and telling her supervisors that they were just wrong was a very brave thing to do. Um, so I think we have two more, and I'm, we're, I'm, I'm, we're still on time. So the, this one is, where do you see your, your field work and field work going in the future? This, in a way, is a, a different answer to the first question. But what I find absolutely fascinating is not only the differences in behavior and cultures, stone uh, tool using cultures, and different use of inherited gestures for different purposes, but also the fact that chimpanzees can be highly adaptable. So a gombi, chimpanzees climb a tree at dusk and make a nest, and they wouldn't dream of leaving it. But in Senegal and Mali, where we also have programs, it's so hot in the day that on moonlit nights, the chimpanzees make use of the moonlight and forage at night. Mm -hmm. uh, they also, in both those countries, spend time in the day in caves. Uh, in Uganda, which the, the habitat is the same as Gombe, more or less, and there, human populations have encroached so much that chimpanzees are losing more and more habitat. So they have been forced into crop raiding, and that's dangerous. So there again, on moonlit nights, they go crop raiding because it's safer. So it's this adaptability and differences between cultures. So one of the things the Jane Goodall Institute is emphasizing is we don't just want to protect the hot spots where there's lots of forests and lots of chimps. We want to protect cultural diversity. Fantastic. So the last question actually speaks to this call, of act, call to action. So the question is, what do you think is the single biggest challenge affecting, li affecting wildlife right now, and what can I do about it? <laughs> well, of course, I suppose it, it depends where you are as to which the biggest challenge is, but there's no gain saying that climate change is, is affecting people and animals and habitat everywhere, and it's getting worse. It's getting worse. So it, it's difficult to think when you are trying to tackle a big thing like climate change. But on the other hand, going back to what I said before, if we're all making ethical choices, if we can move away from the use of fossil fuel, if we think about what each one of us does, that's what we can do. Some people can do more. Some politicians can just sign a, a bill and make huge change. CEOs of big companies can do the same. And, you know, I love to think that not only our Roots and Shoots groups, but other groups too, of young people who are understanding from the beginning what we're doing, that we'll be in time for them to make the kind of difference that we need to make. So it sort of reminds me of the notion of a mile is too far, but we can each take the first step. That's right. Fantastic. So could we have a round of applause for our honorary <laughs> Thank you. So this has been very, very special, Dr. Jane. And as a primatologist and advocate for, uh, for conservation, you have inspired and you will continue to inspire generations of young people who engage in the fields of animal welfare and environmental sustainability. We at Western are so very pleased and honored to recognize your many contributions to primate research and your humanitarian efforts, both in Canada and around the world. At Western, we have been truly inspired, and we are proud today to announce the Jane Goodall Research Award. 
A $5,000 award will focus on providing financial support to Western graduate students investigating great ape populations in Africa or Asia. The award targets, not surprisingly, early career female researchers from Canada, Africa, or Asia who are investigating how community conservation efforts undertaken by the Jane Goodhall Institute of Canada are impacting on great ape populations. Please join me once again in thanking and congratulating Western's newest honorary Doctor of Science, Dame Jane Goodall. I'd also like to take some time to recognize the members of the university community who are here with us today. Western's Board of Governors is charged with the responsibility for overall governance of this institution. Today we have with us Mr. Paul Jenkins, who is our Chair of the Board of Governors, and I'd ask him to stand and be recognized. Today, Dr. Jane, joined a very special group known as Western Alumni, and that group includes over 293,000 living alumni in 150 different countries around the world. Mr. David Simmons is a president of our Alumni Association, and he is here today, and I invite him to say a few words. Mr. Chancellor, Madam Vice Chancellor, what an extraordinary moment this morning was, wasn't it? Wasn't it? I'm uh, inspired and moved by your remarks, Dr. Goodall, and one of the, as you were speaking, I was sitting in my chair reflecting on moments in my childhood and movers who helped me get confidence, and I think in this moment, I just want to, through you, thank all the mothers uh, in the room and in our lives who give us the confidence and the courage to take on crazy ideas that people tell us are never going to work or that are wrong. So I want to applaud my mother, yours, and the ones in the room that have given us courage. So let's do that right now. It's an honor to hear you speak today and a privilege uh, for me and all of us in the room to welcome you to Western and to the Davenport Theater. As my friend and Western's president often says, there's perhaps no greater living scientist in the world than Jane Goodall, and I couldn't agree more after hearing your journey and your accomplishments. While I was a student here at Western, I found my voice and I found my footing, and I took a lesson that has become a belief, and that belief is that through our actions, our deeds, and our words, we draw a circle of caring. And we can either expand that circle and include people and things in it, or we can contract it and exclude people out of it. I think through your words and your deeds, you teach us that a life well lived with compassion for animals, our planet, and each other solves the world problems and expands that circle. Dr. Girdle, we're humbled and we're honored to count you amongst our most distinguished alumni now. You're part of a growing global community numbering more than 293,000 around the world, one of the world's largest alumni networks. On behalf of the Western Alumni Association, it's my utmost pleasure to welcome you to the family. I have a gift for you, Dr. Goodall. The gift is an anukshuk. The word anukshuk means that which acts in the capacity of a human. This is a fitting gift as your life's work challenges us to reconsider human relationships to other species and ultimately, what it truly means to be human. Thank you for joining us here today, sharing your hopeful vision for the future and your inspiration. My time when I walked across the stage, someone wished me well and said that the name of Western will follow me. I asked all of us to thank Dr. Goodall, and I wish that the good name of Western will follow you for the remainder of your days. Congratulations.
Before closing convocation, I wish to express my appreciation to all who have contributed to the success of this special day. In particular, and on your behalf as well, I want to thank the Don Wright Faculty of Music, their dean, Betty Young, Younger, and the talented musicians that provided us with their magnificent performance. My personal thanks to the convocation officers who made this day possible. We hope that uh, you'll stay and enjoy refreshments in the atrium. Uh, Dr. Goodall would be departing for our next engagement. I request that the audience please rise and remain at your seats while the academic procession leaves the theater. Convocation is now adjourned.